It's so good to see you. I am very glad to be back with you, although I did enjoy my time in the Florida Keys, and it was a lot of fun with the family, and we did catch a lot of fish and caught a lot of sun. It was very windy, unlike here. It was very rainy here. It was very windy there, but I just enjoyed my time. If you're visiting with us here at South Bay, I just want to welcome you. In the love of the Lord, you found a good place to come and, and look into. I also want to uh, give a shout out to Pastor Sean. It's not an easy thing to start a series on Revelation, and, and he did such a great job. He did. I'm so proud of him. We worked, we worked on that message, and as we were outlining this whole series, and, and, and I said, you got this, and he's got, I've got this, and, and so he got it, he did it, it was great, I loved it. So we're jumping in, and this is not an easy topic, this is so controversial when you begin to look at Revelation, because there's so many different ways that, that people interpret this, so I'm going to share with you what this whole series, what's on my heart, and I want you to think about this, the things that we talk about are going to create questions. So my hope is that we would erase the big questions and, and be left with little questions. Little question, question marks are good. But uh, I want us not to walk in fear, you know, not, not to walk in uh, mockery or, or uh, unbelief. I want us to walk with a sense of God. Your word is true. And even though I may not understand it in its entirety, I believe it because you said it. And if we'll, if we'll walk in that way, I think we're all going to be blessed. And so we're going to dig in today. And you may not have known that the scripture in the book of Revelation actually has beatitudes. We're familiar with the beatitudes in the Gospels, but there are beatitudes in Revelation, and they are uniquely placed in context, which requires us to look at, all right, here's the blessing, but what surrounds that blessing is important for us to know so that we can be blessed. And today is a very, very intriguing blessing offered to a select few Christians. Let me say that again. It's a blessing designed for a select few Christians. And this might be even more intriguing for you. You don't want to be one of them. All right? I think you'll understand why quickly. But let's pray, and then we're going to jump into Revelation chapter 14. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that you have put the book of Revelation in the Word of God. It's canonized. It's important. We learned last week that you pronounce a trifold blessing on those who read it, those who hear it, and those who do it. So God, we want to be doers of the word. Especially in light of the beatitudes and the blessings that come as we, as we dig into this book. Help us in our unbelief and help us with our understanding. You've told us to ask for wisdom. So Lord, that's what we're asking for right at this moment. Wisdom. Help us, Lord, not just to know, but to also be those who would let the truth of God's Word work in our lives in such a way that it would change the way that we live and to change the way that we love those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to read out of Revelation chapter 14, verse number 13, and then we'll unpack that. Uh, here's how it goes. And I heard a voice from heaven saying... Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And that, that phrase, from now on, is very intriguing to me. So we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit. But, but here's something that's very interesting. The next phrase says, blessed indeed. Or in our current vernacular, true that. That's what the Spirit is saying right here. True that says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So before we even jump in, there are two rarities that I want to lay in front of you that come simply from this verse. The first rarity is that the Holy Spirit is speaking. Very rarely do you find in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is separated out and He speaks for Himself. But this is one of those times, and you have to ask your, yourself the question, why at this particular time, when there's been thousands and thousands of years, people walking the earth, why at this time does the Holy Spirit choose to speak out with his own voice to mankind? 
And the answer to that question is because of the severity of what's about to happen, the intensity and the magnitude of the cataclysmic events that are about to be unleashed upon the earth. The Spirit says, true that. Because it's going to be an intense time. And here's the second rarity that I find. And, and this one may catch you a little bit by surprise. And that is, there's actually a reference in the Bible to a great tribulation saint. Why is this rare? I mean, saints are talked about from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible. Pastor Spiker, why is this rare? Because you have to look at the context. This is an individual saint that's spoken to. When you, when you look at most of the New Testament, you find that the Scripture is spoken to the church. This is not spoken to the church. This is spoken to a saint, an individual. And I want to suggest to you but that by this time, this is, this is Revelation chapter 14, so we have already gone through 14 judgments poured out upon the world. So there are 21 total you find between chapter 6 and chapter 16 of Revelation. So we've gone through 14. And between chapters 12 and 14, you find an intermission, like in between a good movie, a nice long movie. There's a break. Well, there's a break in all of the judgments. The first 14 go by. There's a break where the emphasis is taken off of the earth. It's pointed toward heaven. And inside of heaven, there's this blessing pronounced upon believers on the earth at that time. And it's not so much a blessing. I mean, I titled the message, you know, Blessed are the dead in Christ, right? And that's kind of a downer for a subject title. But I want you to understand what they're going through. It's not not actually their death that's being blessed. It's the life that they've lived. Listen to me. Christians are going to be rare on the earth by the time we get to Revelations chapter 14. You'll see in just a moment as we do a little skip through some of the earlier judgments, but you'll find that the fifth judgment found in Revelations chapter 6 in the first set of judgments, right? Early on in the tribulation that there's these voices, many, many voices that come from the throne of God. Underneath the throne of God are the souls of the martyrs who came out of the tribulation. So already there has been multitudes upon multitudes of people who have lost their lives for their, for their belief in Jesus Christ. And then we move forward, right? We're now in Revelation chapter 14, and now I want to call these guys the stragglers. The stragglers. They're, they're, they're the ones at the end. Because by this time, if you make a profession in faith, of faith in Jesus Christ, it's, if you do so, you do so with the understanding that you're not going to be living very much longer. That's how significant the persecution is going to be at this particular time. And let me give you a reason why. You have seven, seven uh, judgments per series. There's three series, 21 judgments. The first judgments are called the seal judgments. The second judgments are called the trumpet judgments. The third set is called the bowl judgments. In these judgments, the first seven, the earth has the opportunity to repent the people on earth, but they don't. In the second series of judgments, you begin to hear murmurings from people on earth, and they curse God. They, they, they know by that point in time, by the second series of seven, that it is God who is doing this. God is the one who is pouring out his wrath. And don't you know that if they're haters of God at this point in time, what do you think is going to happen to people they can get their hands and teeth on who are still living on the earth? They're going to take out their anger and their frustration. There will be persecution on this earth like never before. That applies to those who are already, already under the throne of God, waiting for the Redeemer to come. We're talking far in the future, inside the seven years of tribulation. Now we have another group of people who are on earth. And I'll tell you another reason why it's rare. The church is not there anymore. Let me read to you out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. I want you to see the picture, because the church at Thessalonica thought they were these people. 
because of all of the persecution that they were going through, they really believed that the Lord forgot them. That, that the rapture occurred and, and they were like, what are we still doing on earth? That's how severe the persecution was for them. But here's Paul's encouragement to them. He says in verse number one, Now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And then Paul goes on to say, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So what could possibly be holding back the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, all those, those individuals? Who, who's holding him back right now because there's a direct reference to he? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holding back the works of lawlessness on the earth right now. And you might ask, well, how does that happen? How, how does that work? Well, He works through you. He works through your life. We just, we just had a series on being filled with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the apostle and the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and the teacher, and how God uses all of them in an organization called the church, the universal church, and how the personality and the wishes of the Lord Jesus Christ are fulfilled through your life. And that's why Jesus said, if I don't go, then the, the leader, the guy, won't come. And he also said, you're going to do greater things than I'm going to do. We are the body of Christ. So what happens when the body of Christ is taken off of this earth? Chaos. That's what. The restrainer is, is the Holy Spirit as he holds back the working of evil on this world. So when the restrainer at the rapture of the church, and Pastor Sean did a great job last week of defining what that is, and, and, and we all walk with an understanding that the church is going to be raptured up, and what's left on earth are a lot of people, two sets of people. There's going to be those who are lost, and they choose to be so, and there's going to be those who thought they were saved. People who are going to go, I thought I was a believer in Jesus, and they're going to find out that they're not believers in Jesus. And they're going to become believers in Jesus. But the, the overarching movement of the church, the kingdom of God on the earth, is gone at that point in time. It's going to be restored when Jesus comes back. But there's not going to be, at least in the first half of that seven years, there's not going to be what we would consider to be the movement of the church on the earth, although there will be people who are Christians on the earth. There's no caveat, there's no different kind of, of Christian on the earth. The same, the same message of salvation is going to grip their hearts as it gripped our hearts. So they're going to walk being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're not going to be able to lock arms. There's not going to be church services. Definitely not later. Maybe early on they'll get into small groups. But we know, according to Revelation chapter 6, persecution in the form of murder and martyrdom is going to come quickly inside of the tribulation. And then you get right to the great tribulation, which is the second three and a half years of the seven years. And it will be almost impossible to live as a Christian during that time. Almost impossible. It will be a freak of nature for a Christian to make it all the way through to the end. Does this impact you? No, it doesn't. I pray that it doesn't. Unless you sit in that seat today and you're going, I'm a believer, but you're really not a believer. And a believing, being a believer in Jesus Christ is one who professes with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Do you know that he's forgiven you of your sins? If you do, you're a believer in Jesus. Praise God for that. You will not be going through this. That's why I'm saying, I said early, you don't want to be one of these blessed guys. You want to be one of y'all blessed guys. That You want to be one of you. You want to be one who has the opportunity be, to be spared from all of this. But it's a beatitude. 
the Bible will still be on earth. The Bible's going to be a guide for people more so, I believe, than it ever has been during the tribulation. There's going to be converts that are going to memorize the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and Matthew chapter 24 and 25 and so many other passages. They're going to be going, what's next? What's next? Oh no, take cover. And, and that's what it's going to be like because it's going to be one right after another. So the context of this because those words from now on are really intriguing to me. So I want to go back and offer to you a context, if you will, of the, the blessing that we find in Revelation chapter 14. So in keeping with context, I want to go back to Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 19. Because Revelation 1.19, I believe, is the outline for the entire book. And by the way... Those of you who believe that you should never study Revelation because it just makes you wacky in the brain, I want to I suggest something different. I want to suggest that you get into the book of Revelation. Make it a study book for you. And here's what you do. Every time you come upon a topic that you do not understand or that does not make sense, you go into the scripture and find that same symbol or likeness or event or person. Find that somewhere else in scripture and begin to study that and you'll have defined for you what it is in Revelation by the type or, or the picture that's given elsewhere in Scripture. If you'll do that, you'll spend a lot of time in other parts of the Bible. As a matter of fact, you'll probably read the entire Bible to, to help you understand what the book of Revelation is. See, God's sneaky. He knows how to get you into the Word of God. If you really want to know what's coming, start in the book of Revelation. It'll take you all through Scripture. That's my challenge to you. The book of Revelation is exciting. It's very exciting. And I believe we're close to it. We're very, very close. So here's what Revelation 1.19 says. John's on the Isle of Patmos. He's being spoken to by the Holy Spirit. He gets, he gets taken to heaven. He's, he's, he's listening. And here's what's given to him by the Lord. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are... And those that are to take place after this. And that, my friend, is the outline to the book of Revelation. Because Revelation is broken up into three pieces. The things that have happened already. The things that are happening. And the things that are going to happen. And if you look at chapter 1 of Revelation. If you want to see a picture of Jesus when he, in John chapter 20, when he ascends to the Father. After he resurrects from the tomb. You, you have a beautiful picture of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Glorified in heaven in Revelations chapter 1. That's already happened. That's how he sits today. And then if you go to Revelations chapter 2 and 3, you find seven epistles written by Jesus to the church. And these seven letters that Jesus wrote are significant because they cross, they cross time, they cross condition, they speak to an individual, they speak to a small group, they speak to a church at large, they speak to a church in a region, they speak to a nation, they speak to the entire church universal. It's amazing how pointed and appropriate the letters that Jesus wrote to the churches are. I would encourage you to get in them. Study those as well. Those are. It's the church age. It's the time right now where the church is on the earth. Then you get to Revelation chapter 4, all the way through Revelation 22, and it hasn't happened yet. In Revelation chapter 4, you have a picture of the church in heaven. And never again after Revelation chapter 4 is the church spoken of as on earth, except for these rare occasions when you find Christians spoken to like Revelation chapter 14. So the blessing is placed in the interlude or the intermission. So you have a series of 14 judgments that have taken place already. And let me tell you, at this point in time, the earth is absolutely in shambles. But it's going to get worse. Now, I am not here today to give you doom and gloom. I'm here today to encourage you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Do not trust your bank account. Do not trust your career. Do not trust your government. Love your government. Love people. Love your bank account. That's great. You can do all those things. But if you put your trust in those things, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Trust Jesus. 
Because the things that he has said are going to come to pass. And just because we haven't seen them yet, that doesn't mean they're not going to come to pass. He has a fantastic track record of fulfilling all of the prophecies that have been spoken. So you find in Revelation chapter 6, the first series of judgments. You have the rider on the white horse that shows up. That's the Antichrist. You might ask the question, why does he show up on a white horse? Because he's a counterfeit. He's the Antichrist, not against Christ, instead of Christ. In the Greek, that word anti means instead of. So he's here to try to deceive the world. Let the world know that he is Jesus Christ, come in the flesh. And he's not. He's a counterfeit. Because in Revelation chapter 19, you see the true rider on the white horse. His name's Jesus Christ. And he comes back with the church at the, at the very end of the battle of Armageddon. And he sets things straight. But the deceiver, like a puppet, he puts the beast on his hand and he begins to use the beast as a mouthpiece. And that's the introduction of the tribulation. That's the introduction to all of these judgments. And that's Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1. Then you have the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. And then you have those souls under the altar of God, under the throne of God. And they are crying out, How long, O oh Lord, are you going to put up with this? Many people who have been martyred in the early stages of the tribulation. And by Revelation 14, the verse that we're focusing on, that's much, much later. So there are many people who have lost their lives. And then you have Revelation 6, verses 12 to 17. You have this great earthquake. And the passage says that it moves mountains off of their place. Now, I just want to stop here for a minute and, and bring this into perspective. And so I did a little research, and I'm just going to share a few things with you. And that is that uh, as of right now, and, and I think I'm on the conservative side, we have about a thousand on the face of the earth operating oil-based or water-based oil rigs right now. 175 of those are in the Gulf of Mexico, in case you were wondering. There's about 185 that are in, in the Persian Gulf, and the rest of them are spread through gulfs in coastal areas all across the earth. And there are many, many more hundreds that are no longer functional, but they're capped and they're sitting there. But you all, I don't know how many of you were here when BP went through the disaster that we went through. Now understand, that's one. That's one oil rig. Just for the sake of discussion, let's, let's pretend that a hundred of those, because of a worldwide, and that's what the scripture speaks about, a worldwide earthquake, and mountains are moved off their place, which means there's a shifting. I wonder what would happen to these pipes that go from the top of the water all the way down to the bottom and then sometimes miles into the, into the muck and the mud. I wonder what happened if, if those just snapped. Number one, we would not have the resources to be able to fix them all. So just imagine, now the Gulf Stream operates, we have the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream moves the water down through the Florida Keys, up the East Coast, along Canada, Greenland, touches Scotland and Ireland and Great Britain, comes down to the, to the western side of Europe, over to the north and western side of Africa, moves over to the north side of South America, right up into the Central America, Yucatan Peninsula, that whole thing. So we have hundreds of oil rigs that are broken, unstoppable, and we just have this churning. That's just in our sphere, let alone what's going on in China, around Australia, in the Persian Gulf, in the Mediterranean, all over the world. Just imagine the catastrophe that could be set in place by the fifth of the judgments poured out upon the earth. Here's something else I want you to think about. And th these are... These are just things, what I call signs and wonders, things that, that should make us go, hmm, I wonder how God is going to do this. Presently today, I want to encourage you to study this, Floridian. Presently today, USF is doing a study of something called sargasm. Sargasm is the name of a, of a seaweed. It's a normal occurring seaweed. We saw it the whole time we were in the Keys. It's natural. It's good. It holds all kinds of abundant marine life. It's yellow. It's got little, little kind of caper-sized uh, little beads on it. And many of, of God's wonderful creation uses that as, as home. It's beautiful. 
Never recorded in the history, and we've been watching this for 20 years, I speak we as though I'm a scientist. I say we because I read it. Um, sargasm typically stretches uh, out into the Atlantic a little bit. But in 2019, they did their satellite research and they found that there's a strip of this seaweed that stretches from the coast of Africa to the Yukonan Peninsula. 5,500 miles long and 550 miles wide. It's taking over, you've probably not even heard this, research it. It's taking over the bottom half of the Atlantic Ocean. And you might think, well, big deal. That means there's more life, right? Well, the issue is water is cooled by the undercurrents. The sargasm is on the top of the water and it receives direct sunlight. So we have, in effect, a 5,500 mile long, 550 mile wide heating pad in the Atlantic Ocean right now. And they don't know how to stop it. They don't even know how to explain why it's here. But it continues to grow. USF is leading the research in that. Go online, type in S-A-R-G-A-S-S-U-M, sargasm, it's the name of the seaweed, and just be good in your re do your research. One more, and I'll jump back in. At the basin of the Mississippi River, you have an area where all of the tributaries, all of the rivers up all the way through the United States pour into the Mississippi River. And at the base where it meets the Gulf of Mexico, there's a phenomenon that's growing. And again, the scientists have no way to stop this. There's an 8,700 square mile area where there is no oxygen in the water. Zero. Every living thing is dead. Animals that go into it, they die because they can't even breathe. There's no water. What's it coming from? It's coming from the pollutants, the pesticides, the, the, the chemicals that are being poured into all the rivers and the tributaries. It's coming down. Read it. Don't take my word for it. You look it up. But it's interesting because the scripture tells us that in the end times, the water is going to turn to blood. Nothing is going to live in it. Just imagine right now a, a, an area that's almost 9,000 square miles where there's no living things in it. It's happening right now at the basin of the, of the Mississippi River. And again, the scientists have no way to stop it. We would have to change our entire way of life in our country to stop the effects of that happening. That's all a part of the Gulf Stream. Those are things for us to just begin to think about and go, I wonder how God is going to do the things that he's going to do. Because he's going to do it. Praise God, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we're not going to be here when God pulls the gate, the pin to the gate, and allows all of this to begin to go into full, full motion. This, this, what I'm describing to you, I believe, is in the first, very first days of, of the tribulation. The tribulation is a seven-year period. It's broken up into two segments. The first half is called the tribulation. The second half, three and a half years, is called the great tribulation. And that's where the earth will, will not even be recognizable to you and I if we were to come back from heaven. It's just not going to be a place that you want to be. We find, we find hail burning mountains. We find meteorites hitting the earth. The sun and the moon and the stars are all darkened by a third. That's not overnight. That's permanently until Jesus changes it. Plagues of locusts. There, there's uh, uh, demonic presences that are seen now by people on the earth. Um, it's really, really remarkable. Now I want to stop here and say now is the place that the blessing is pronounced. Now is the place. So all this has happened. And then the Holy Spirit in an angelic voice say, Blessed are you if you die in the Lord from this point forward. People on earth are going to be so livid and so angry. The scripture shows us where they curse God. They, they writhe in, in anger for what God is doing to them. And they don't recognize that they've done it to themselves based upon their own sin. They hurl, they hurl their insults and their blasphemies and their curses to the Lord. And then 
we enter into the seven bowl judgments. We don't have time to go into the bowl judgments today, but, but I, I just want to suggest to you that the bowl judgments are so severe that they have to be done in a short sequence, rapid fire, in the very, very end of, of uh, what we would consider to be time on this earth. Um, and it, it's, 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 it's staggering, uh, to, to say the least. So we'll talk about those more. I want to finish this morning by talking about um, this last phrase, their deeds follow them. This is, this is what the Holy Spirit said, their deeds follow them. And, and really what that is, is it's not a focus upon their death or how they day, die, it's based upon their life. These great tribulation saints, they know that if they accept Jesus as their Savior, it's the kiss of death when it comes to this earth. And, and there are people, and, and I'll finish with this, there, there are people today who believe that, you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to live the way that I want to live today. In all of our freedom, right? We have freedom. Uh, I'm going to live the way that I want to live today. And if, if anybody ever points a gun at me or if I'm ever, you know, uh, it's down to the wire, I, I, will, I will put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. And I just want to say to you, when, when, if there's ever a gun pointed at you and you're not already a follower of Jesus Christ, um, it's, it's ludicrous to think that, that you may say it, but that doesn't make it so. It, it's, it's, the, it's the life that you live. And these particular people, when they accept Christ as their Savior, these blessed individuals, when they accept Christ as their Savior, they know that doing so costs them everything. Everything. And I got to thinking, I wonder, I wonder if I was arrested for being a Christian, if there's enough evidence to incriminate me. I wonder if they would just bypass me and say, well, guys, we don't find enough evidence to convict you as a Christian, so we're going to move on to some other people. What about your life? What, what do you look at in your life that would separate you out as a true follower of Jesus Christ? Well, these particular people in Revelation, well... What the Spirit of the Lord said in Revelation 14 is, is their life. They're going to rest from what they've had to go through because it's going to be very, very severe. Let me finish with this. Number one, there's only going to be a few people, really, compared to the number of Christians that walk the earth today, there's only going to be a few people during that time who are Christ followers. The second thing is... It will be intensely difficult to survive during that time. And the third thing is this. The world is going to be filled with hatred because the, the, the Holy Spirit who lives in you is not going to be on earth anymore. He'll be on earth in them, but there's not going to be a Bible study that they can go to. There's not going to be friends that they can call. There's, they're, they're, they're going to be on their own. On their own. So my challenge to you this morning is two prongs to it, okay? The first prong is this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, but there are parts of your life that you've not surrendered to Jesus, I want to challenge you today to get right with the Lord. I want to challenge you today to, to rise up. A couple weeks ago, I finished a message by asking, are you apostles, are you prophets, are you evangelists, are you pastors, are you teachers? We had over a hundred people who wrote down on pieces of paper what they felt like the Spirit of the Lord said they were. Some of you. We had so many respond to that message. I want to challenge you. Let's get into gear. Even though you may not understand that or, or, or you're having a hard time figuring that out, let's do that together. Let's start ramping up our faith in such a way that we could be incriminated if it came to that. And the second thing is this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's going to come a time when either you will pass away or the church as you know it today is going to pass away from this earth. We've gone on to a new place. And that begins the end. But you don't have to wait for that to happen. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today. Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm asking that the blood of Jesus would cover my life. 
I'm asking that you would forgive me of my sin. sin. I, I confess the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are my Savior. As of this moment forward, you're the Lord of my life. That's what you need to do. And you won't even have to worry about this end time stuff. Because you will be taken with the church because you are part of the church with the decision that you just made. You will be in heaven with God forever. And I'm looking forward to talking to you more about that in the weeks to come. But I don't know if we have weeks. I don't know. None of us knows. So the day to make the decision is today. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? Maybe today you would... Invite Jesus into your heart, just like I prayed a moment ago. Why don't you do that right there in your seat? Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I absolutely confess that I am sinful. And I need to be saved. I want to be saved. I'm asking you to take the reins of my life. Come in and help me overcome my sin. And he'll do it right away. ask our prayer warriors to come on forward. Prayer warriors? Friend, if you would like prayer about anything in your life, we're here to minister to you. That's why we're even on this planet. To be a ministry to others. So I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, Inside these boxes up here on the end of the platform, there's a book in there. It's called Ten Steps Toward Christ. It's written by Jimmy Evans, great man of the Lord. And it's a book that will help you in your early steps as a Christian. If you want somebody to pray for you, whatever you got going on in your life, that's what we're here to do. And we're not praying for you because we have it all sorted out. We're just praying for you because we know the power. His name is Jesus. And we'd love to help you figure out how to get Jesus into some of the struggles that you're facing. We're not perfect. There's nobody perfect allowed in this building. Except Jesus. Let me pray one more time. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the truth that we find in Revelation chapter 14. Thank you for the fact that your word is all truth. But particularly, Lord, this is touching our hearts today. Thank you for sparing us from that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who just accepted Jesus as their Savior. Thank you that their names are being written in the Lamb's Book of Life right now. And God, we say you are worthy of praise and glory and honor. We're grateful to be your children. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. More to come.